Let's read together our text for this morning. Our text is especially John 3, verses 22 through 26, though we shall range a bit within the passage we read in John 3 and 4 and into Acts 19. John 3, verses 22 through 26. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salem, because there was much water there. They came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth thee, and all men come to him. I'm going to say the next few words deliberately, very slowly, because I want you all to follow in your mind the events of John the Baptist's public ministry and Christ's early ministry to this point. <clears throat> First, John preaches and baptizes. Then, he baptizes Jesus of Nazareth. After which, Christ spends 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And those three things are especially recorded in the first three gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then, and now we're into the gospel according to John, then in the second half of John 1, we have the various days that we spoke of in the previous few sermons. Day 1. A delegation of Jews come to John to ask him who he is and why he is baptizing. Day two, Jesus comes to John the Baptist and John proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God. Day three, John proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God. And some of John's disciples switch allegiance from John to Jesus. After that, and now we're into John chapter 2, Jesus and his disciples go to a wedding in Cana, where the Lord turns water into wine. Then Christ cleanses the temple for the first time. And now we're into John 3. Then we have Christ's famous discourse with Nicodemus, telling him, ye must be born again. And then we have our passage. In the second half of John 3, which we will consider together today. In the passage we read earlier together from John 3 and into John 4, gives us the longest and most detailed comparison between John and Jesus found anywhere in the Holy Scriptures. And the reason for this is easy to grasp. Here alone we see John the Baptist and Jesus Christ both ministering in Judea at the same time and baptizing. Here alone we see some of John the Baptist's disciples coming to him to ask him about Jesus' baptizing ministry. Because they're agreed that more are following Jesus than their master. We'll look at that this evening. And here too, in this passage, we have John's longest comparison between his ministry and Christ's ministry. And so, with this, appropriately enough, John is fading away. Christ is increasing, John the Baptist is decreasing. 
Jesus Christ must increase and John must <coughs> decrease. He knows that. He says that. In fact, our passage this Lord's Day contains John the Baptist's last recorded baptisms and last recorded public utterance before he was imprisoned. And he was never to be released from his jail. So let's consider then the baptisms of John <coughs> and Jesus. And the baptisms here are not spiritual baptisms as such, they are water baptisms. The baptisms, the water baptisms of John and Jesus. More particularly, they are the baptisms that they or their disciples administer. The baptisms of John and Jesus, we look at the contemporaneous activity, the fact that the two men baptized at the same time, the contemporaneous activity, and the essential unity. The baptisms of John and Jesus, the contemporaneous activity, and the essential unity. Now those of you who have been with us on this series on John the Baptist's public ministry might well have thought that after all that has been said so far on the subject of baptism in this series, that we were finished with this subject. But you would be wrong. I remind you of the name. He's John the Baptist. And you would especially be wrong to think that we're finished with the subject of baptism because scripture itself and its treatment of John isn't finished with baptism. Witness the passage we read in John 3 and 4. This morning we will not be going over old ground or old material rehashed. We will be considering baptism this morning and a whole host of new points. So we will build on what we have seen and fill out this important subject more completely so that it will take a firmer hold on us. And grasping this, we have a better understanding of who John was and what he and his baptism was all about. Now first of all, I'd like you to consider with me four simple observations on baptism from the passage we read in John 3 and 4. First, Jesus baptized. And again, I'm talking now about water baptism. I'm not talking about the inward spiritual baptism which Christ alone works in the heart of his elect. Jesus baptized. Perhaps before this morning, you were not aware of this. And indeed it is true that only the fourth gospel mentions it, Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't. But John 3 verse 24 explicitly affirms, After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them, and there he baptized. Second, and more precisely, Jesus baptized through his disciples. He himself did not administer the water baptism, but they, his disciples did, at his command. Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, then comes the clarifying statement in parentheses or brackets, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. And there's a reason why Jesus didn't administer baptism, but his disciples did at his behest. Christ's role in baptism is to give the thing signified and sealed in baptism, inwardly, spiritual, the forgiveness of sins and life. And so it's the disciples who administer the water, including now John and Andrew and Peter and Philip and Nathaniel 
the five we mentioned in John 1 in our last sermon in this series last week. Also, I would add that from the Holy Scriptures, there is no indication that John the Baptist's disciples ever administered baptism. So John baptizes, but his disciples actually didn't. But Jesus doesn't actually administer the water baptism, but Jesus' disciples do. Third, Christ's baptizing through his disciples was contemporaneous with part of John the Baptist's baptizing ministry. The two men were baptizing, that is, at the same time. As regards Jesus, we read in verse 22 of chapter 3 that Jesus remained in Judea and baptized. And verse 23 says, regarding John the Baptist, and John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem. This, of course, raises the question, what about after John was put in prison? John didn't do any baptizing when he was in prison. But did Jesus Christ and his disciples stop baptizing when John was put in prison? And I think that Jesus and his disciples did stop baptizing when John stopped baptizing, that is, when he was put behind bars. And certain it is that we do not read of Christ and his disciples baptizing after John was in prison in any of the four Gospels. Although it's hard to be dogmatic on this because we're dealing with a silence in the Bible. And then fourth and finally in this connection, while John and Jesus were baptizing contemporaneously, Jesus, through his disciples now, was baptizing more people than John the Baptist. Jesus Christ himself and the Pharisees recognized this. Chapter 4, verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, John the Baptist and his disciples knew this too. John 3 verse 26. John's disciples say to him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, Jesus Christ who was baptized by John and Bethabara, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. This is one of the many comparisons in this passage between John and Jesus. John is on his way down, so to speak. He's baptizing less than Jesus. And Jesus is on the way up, so to speak. He's baptizing more than John, and everybody knew it. John is fading away. As well as these four observations concerning baptism drawn from our passage, there are two things in our passage that are urged in the debate between Baptists and pedo-Baptists regarding the meaning and mode of baptism. Some Baptists urge the place where John was baptizing in John 3 verse 3 in support of immersionism. John 3 verse 23 says, John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. See, says the Baptist, why else would John the Baptist go to Anon where there was much water unless baptism was by immersion only. You grasp their argument. But now apart from the fact that as we have seen in Psalm 92, the scriptures and ancient Greek writings, but we look particularly at the scriptures, render the understanding of baptism as immersion totally impossible. Besides that, 
The word Anon is from the Hebrew word Ayan, which means spring. And Anon, from this Semitic root, means springs. And spring is when water bubbles up from under the ground. And it, John was baptizing in Anon because there was much water, or even more literally, many waters there. He was baptizing in a town named after springs because there were many springs there. And these many springs of water in Anon were particularly good for baptizing and for drinking humans and animals because there you have particularly fresh and clean water. And on your bulletin there's a quote from a Baptist scholar, D.A. Carson, and he, and he says, Doubtless it's called Anon because it means springs, and there are therefore many waters there. And so the place of John's baptism, Anon, doesn't support or favour the Baptist view of immersion. And immersionism. By the way, this place Anon, mentioned in verse 33, there's a place named the same, Ain, or Ain, in southern Judah, in Joshua 15, verse 32. And it may well have been the same <coughs> place, this place of springs that Joshua knew of centuries before. That's an argument by the Baptists based on the place Anon for immersionism. There's another key word we should mention, <coughs> the word purifying at the end of verse 25. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Purifying. Now, the word purifying here does support the reformed view of the meaning of baptism. We have all these references to baptism in verses 22 and 23. Jesus is baptizing, John is baptizing, and then we have in verse 25, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Then this question arose about purifying. There's all these baptisms going on, and then they think, what about purifying? And the idea is, you see, that baptism is a symbolic act signifying purifying. All these baptisms going on, and then naturally the question arises about purifying. Because the water in the rite of baptism is not presented in the scriptures as an enveloping liquid. That is a liquid which totally surrounds the person baptized, into which the person is rapidly submerged, goes down, and then rapidly emerges, coming up, well be fairly rapid or else the person will drown. But the water in baptism isn't an enveloping <coughs> liquid. The water in baptism is symbolic of washing, which is the number one idea with water all over the world. Water washes, the universal solvent it's called. Baptism and the water of baptism symbolizes washing or purifying or cleansing. <coughs> That's the idea. And you can easily see how this dispute arose here between some of John the Baptist's disciples and the Jews because these various parties are aware of various baptisms or purifications or washings. There were the Mosaic baptisms or washings or cleansings mentioned as we saw in Hebrews 9 verse 10. And then in Mark 7 for instance there were other Jewish baptisms or washings or cleansings where they would baptize hands before meals, or wash or cleanse cups or couches. 
Then there's John the Baptist, and he's an Anon, and he's baptizing and purifying. And then there's the Lord Jesus at the same time with his disciples. He's baptizing and washing and performing purifying and symbolic rites. And so with these baptisms in mind, the question naturally arises, are all these baptisms the same? Or are they different? What sort of baptisms are they? And the Mosaic baptisms and the Jewish baptisms are ceremonial <clears throat> baptisms. They make something ceremonially clean. Whereas John the Baptist's baptism and Christ's baptism aren't ceremonial. They're a much higher order baptism. They symbolize moral and spiritual inward cleansing. So you can see how people would need to get this straight and how questions would arise and disputes between different groups. And then they would say, well, these baptisms, are they all authorized by God? And the Mosaic baptisms, the ceremonial cleansings, were most definitely authorized by God in the law. They're written about and recorded in the Holy Scriptures in Exodus through Deuteronomy. Ceremonial washings for the Old Testament era. But the later washings and ablutions and purifyings and baptisms added by the Jews had no authority from God. They were man-made ordinances based on erroneous human tradition, the tradition of the Jewish elders. John's baptism, it most definitely was commanded by God because God spoke to him and commanded him to baptize. John 1 says that. Christ's baptism as the Son of God was divinely authorized too. Beside all that, we can see why a question arose here between some of John's disciples and some of the Jews about purifying because John was baptizing over here, and Jesus was baptizing over there, and the Jews were aware of Mosaic baptisms and Jewish traditional baptisms, which all brings us to this point. Baptisms are purifyings, are washings, are cleansings. That's the idea. And now, after we made these four initial observations concerning baptism drawn from the text, and we looked at the two things in our text urged by different parties concerning the meaning of baptism, purifying, and the mode of baptism, whether it's by immersion or something else, we need to ask this question and answer it, a question which may well have been forming in the minds of some of you through this series, in fact, what some of you have already mentioned to me, this key question. Are the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus through his disciples and the water baptisms from Pentecost onwards as practiced in Christian churches, are these baptisms essentially the same baptism? Now, there are some slight differences, we'll touch on that later, but are they essentially, in their heart and core and center, essentially the same? Or are these baptisms essentially different? <coughs> and I believe that the baptisms of John the Baptist, the baptisms administered by Christ's disciples in John 3 and 4, and Christian baptism <coughs> are essentially the same. This is the view, for instance, of Herman Hooksema and John Calvin, and there's a treatment on the back of your bulletin for you to read at leisure for yourself. Now I argue this because these baptisms by Christ, Christ's disciples, and the Christian church for 2,000 years, they all involve water. They involve water which symbolizes, in all instances, the washing away or forgiveness of sins. Water which symbolizes the washing away of sins for those who repent, not hypocrites. That's the way it was with John the Baptist's baptism, with Christ and his disciples' baptism, and the baptisms administered in the New Testament of the church. All of these three baptisms too are related to true discipleship. John the Baptist baptized, and these people 
followed him, heeded his admonitions, became his disciples. Some of them more officially became his disciples, and others more at a distance. Jesus' baptism here is connected with discipleship. John 4, verse 1. When therefore the Lord how the when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. In short, John the Baptist's baptism, the baptism of Jesus through his disciples in John 3 and 4, and Christian baptism administered in the church for the last two millennia, are all about covenant initiation. They teach the same essential doctrine of covenant membership and inclusion. Repentance, turning away from sin from the heart. Water, symbolizing the washing away and forgiveness of sins. They're all connected with the Messiah in whom alone forgiveness is to be found. And they call to a life of discipleship. By the way, it's interesting that the Roman Catholic Church, in its Council of Trent, <coughs> officially anathematizes, that is, curses and damns to hell, anybody who says that the baptism of John and the baptism in the New Testament Christian Church are essentially the same. But we'll try not to let that worry or disturb us too much. If this isn't the view that we hold, that is, if these baptisms, John the Baptists, the disciples here in John 3 and 4, and Christian baptism, if these baptisms are not essentially the same, then we end up with, in some form or other, anabaptism. And anabaptism, the, word, the, the phrase or prefix ana there, means again. You end up with re-baptizing with people being baptized with water twice or three times think for instance of the people baptized by John if John's baptism isn't the same as the baptism essentially as the baptism ministered by Jesus through his disciples here then you would have to have the disciples the people who are baptized by John the Baptist then being re-baptized by Jesus and his disciples. So, on the same day, or perhaps the day after, this one was baptized by John the Baptist and Enon, then he heads up to Jesus and his disciples and says, well, he's the Messiah, his baptism must be more important, and then they're baptized with water again. And then one wonders if all these baptisms are not the same. Then, the people baptized by John the Baptist, and possibly also baptized by Jesus' disciples, would presumably have to be baptized Rebaptized at Pentecost with Christian baptism in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And is that really what we think happened? Think too of the disciples of Jesus, the official disciples of Jesus, the twelve. At least some of Jesus' disciples we know had been baptized had been disciples of John the Baptist beforehand. We saw them last week. John the beloved disciple, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel. As disciples of John the Baptist, those men were baptized by John the Baptist. Are we going to hold, if these baptisms aren't the same, that then these men baptized each other later on here in John 3 and 4? Or that these men later on were baptized with water after Pentecost, or even on the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> or maybe, if you go this way of rebaptizing and anabaptizing, <coughs> maybe those people who were baptized by God, by Christ's disciple in John 3 and 4, maybe they had to be rebaptized at Pentecost too, or shortly thereafter. And the answer is no. No to all this rebaptizing, because the baptisms of John and the baptisms administered by Jesus' disciples in John 3 and 4 and Christian baptism are essentially <coughs> one. They're essentially teaching the same doctrine. You're baptized into the Messiah. 
the one who was to come when John started his preaching, the one who was present, as here in John 3 and 4, or the one who has come, died for our sins, and been raised from the dead and seated at God's right hand, as we have now. It's all about all these baptisms, essentially one of this, forgiveness of sins in Christ. They're all with water, therefore. They all issue the call to repent and live as disciples in the communion of God's people. And now those of you who are more aware of this issue, or those of you who remember that we read Acts 19 earlier, are aware that this raises the question as to the meaning of this passage from the book of Acts. You should probably turn to this passage now, if you will. What about these? What about Acts 19, 1 through 7? Well, here, while you're paging, Paul is in Ephesus, in western Turkey, in today's geography. He's near the start of his third missionary journey, where he meets disciples, as they're called in verse 1, and there are about 12 of them, verse 7 says. These disciples are evidently disciples of John the Baptist, who somehow or other are now not in Judea, where John ministered, but in western Turkey. The disciples of John the Baptist, that's made clear in verses 3 and 4. But these 12 who were baptized, about them we read in verse 2, John, Paul asks them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since, or better, when ye believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And when you read that, you think, huh? No Holy Ghost? These people aren't aware of the Holy Ghost. That's what it seems to say. And then you think, no, that's not what it means because there are many, many references to the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. In fact, you only need to get to the second verse of the Bible Genesis 1 verse 2, which refers to the Spirit moving on the face of the waters. Moreover, as disciples of John the Baptist, they knew fine well that John spoke of the Holy Spirit in his preaching. He said, Matthew 3 11, I baptize you with water. I can only put water on you externally. But there's one coming after me, mightier than I, and he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost, an inward spiritual transforming baptism. So as disciples of John the Baptist, they knew because John the Baptist told them about the Holy Spirit. Moreover, these 12 or so men at Ephesus could not have truly believed John the Baptist's preaching unless the Holy Spirit were within them. Because the Holy Spirit alone is the one who gives us faith and repentance. So they knew fine well there was a Holy Spirit. But what they did not know was that the Holy Spirit had been poured out on Pentecost. And that the Holy Spirit poured out on Pentecost manifested his coming by miraculous gifts. And so this reference to not knowing about the Holy Spirit in Acts 19 verse 2 is very similar to, to the statement in John 7 verse 39 which says, The Holy Ghost was not yet because that Jesus was not yet glorified. The Holy Spirit's eternal pre-existing the world. The Holy Spirit was not yet given is the word added in italics rightly to by our authorised version. The Holy Spirit had not yet come as the one poured out by Jesus on Pentecost as proof that he's ascended into heaven, as the one who's now going to gather a New Testament Catholic or universal church. That's what it means. And so Acts 19 verse 6 refers to miraculous gifts. They're speaking in tongues like the foreign languages in Acts 2. And they're prophesying, uttering the wonderful works of God. Let's move on. Then verse 3, Paul says to these 12 disciples of John the Baptist, 
John, ver sorry, verse 3. Unto what then were ye baptized? He asked them. And they said, Unto John's baptism. And then verse 5 mentions a baptism. And some people reckon that verse 5 refers to water baptism. And water baptism administered there and then to the twelve disciples of John the Baptist who had already <coughs> received water baptism at the hand of John the Baptist. Now I disagree with that reading. And those who hold this view with me oppose this reading that these twelve were baptized with water twice by responding in one of two ways. And both of the ways of responding involve closely linking two verses. Closely linking two verses. First of all, some, including Herman Huxema and Francis Turn, take verses 4 and 5 intimately together. And they see verses 4 and 5 together both verses containing Paul's summary of John's baptizing the people years ago. Paul said to them, therefore, in this reading, verse 4, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on the one who was going to come after them, that is, the Messiah, whom we now know to be Christ Jesus. And when they, that is, the people who heard John the Baptist preach, in the wilderness or by the river Jordan, when they heard this, that the Messiah was coming, they, the people who first heard John preach, were baptized by John the Baptist all those years ago in the name of the coming Lord whom we know to be the Lord Jesus. Others say, reaching the same conclusion, that it's not so much verses 4 and 5 that are to be taken together, but verses 5 and 6 that are to be taken together. And this is John Calvin's view expressed on the back of the bulletin. So verse 5 says, When they heard this, this time understanding the day to be the twelve or so disciples in Ephesus, when they heard this, they, the twelve or so disciples in Ephesus, were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then verse 6 explains the nature of this baptism then, not as water baptism, but as a Holy Ghost baptism. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the laying on of hands was their baptism, not the application of water. The Holy Ghost came upon them. So that they received miraculous gifts speaking in other languages and prophesied of God's mighty works. And this is indeed a scriptural use of the word baptism. Baptism in the Bible doesn't always mean baptizing with water. In many places it means a baptism with the Holy Spirit because when the Holy Spirit was poured out on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and when the Holy Spirit fell upon Cornelius and his household in Acts 10 and 11, that the coming of the Spirit upon them and giving them miraculous gifts, that is called a baptism. Because of the gifts they were given. In fact, the book of Acts refers to four great spiritual baptisms. The Jews in Acts 2, the Samaritans in Acts 8, the Gentiles in Acts 10 and 11, and these disciples of John the Baptist in Acts 19. And the baptisms that came in these four groups, Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles, and disciples of John the Baptist who hadn't realized that Christ had come and poured out the Holy Spirit, these baptisms with the Spirit upon them, take these Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles, and disciples of John the Baptist, and bring them into the New Testament Catholic or universal church by the power of this transforming baptism. Now we need to go a step further. This essential unity 
of John the Baptist's water baptism, the water baptism administered by Christ's disciples in John 3 and 4, and water baptism in the Christian church raises another question. What about the baptism of the children of believers? Did John the Baptist baptize the children of his converts? In my opinion it is, I say opinion because the Bible doesn't give us a whole lot to go on at this point, my opinion is no. I personally do not believe, and this is the standard position of the Reformed churches, including Uxima, that the children of believers and converts were not baptized. At least there's no mention of it in the Bible. Then you see the polemic with the Baptists rise up again, because here the Baptists will argue, and you can see the force of this argument if you're able to follow this, because it's not the easiest sermon, but we need to grapple with the difficult things too at times. The Baptists would say to this, Ah! But hold on a minute. You have said, I hope you're grasping the force of this argument. You have said, number one, it's all essentially the same baptism. The baptism of John the Baptist, the baptism of the disciples of Jesus, John 3 and 4, and Christian baptism. It's all the same baptism, baptism right? Essentially. And you have just said that John the Baptist did not baptize the children of the believers. Therefore, the argument goes, Therefore, John the Baptist didn't baptize the infants of believers, and John's baptism is essentially the same as Christian baptism, then the Baptist view is correct, and the children of believers ought not be baptized in the New Testament church age. Doesn't sound too bad in the argument, actually. It's one of the better ones. But I'm going to explain why that does not follow. I'm going to make several arguments, with each one going further and getting stronger. The first one is, think of the baptismal formula. In the Great Commission, which Jesus issued to his disciples in Matthew 28, which governs the spread of the New Testament church after Pentecost, they were told, baptize them in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And apparently, the baptisms administered by John the Baptist and by Jesus' disciples in John 3 and 4 did not use the baptismal formula in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Revelation hadn't unfolded this story then. But now note, this name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, reveals especially the true God is a family God. The first person is the Father, and the second person is the Son. Once you baptize in that name, you're indicating that the God who saves his people is the family God, and he saves families, fathers, and sons, which is signifying the same in baptism. Let's move on to a second point. Think of the Catholicity or universality of the church. John the Baptist and Christ through his disciples are baptizing in this passage in John 3 and 4. Who are they baptizing? Only Jews, not Gentiles. They're apparently only baptizing adults. I don't think it's the children of believers here. But after Pentecost, after Pentecost, the Church of Jesus Christ becomes Catholic or universal. It consists no longer just of Jews or Gentiles who become Jews. It consists of Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles saved as Gentiles. And the Catholic Church of Jesus Christ, after Pentecost, most definitely includes boys and girls in the way that the Old Testament Church was not so clear on. Because baptism unlike circumcision, can only can be administered not only on boys, but also girls, where circumcision was suited only for boys. And in the Old Testament, males had a higher role via females than they do in the New Testament. And I think of this too. We're getting more and more higher up and near the key point here. John the Baptist 
represents an intermediate stage between the Old Testament and the New Testament. John's sort of in the middle, straddling the two. John, Jesus taught this, all the prophets and the law, Old Testament, prophesied unto John, Matthew 11. The law and the prophets, Jesus said, were until John, Luke 16, verse 16. Then comes the kingdom of God. He's in the middle, straddling the two. And then, you see, when John is preaching here, circumcision for covenant children had yet to be replaced by baptism. The children, when John is baptizing here, are still being circumcised. But after Pentecost, the circumcision of the children of believers is replaced <coughs> by the baptism of their children. Think of it this way. Before John, adults circumcised. Children circumcised. I'm talking about boy children. Meals. When John the Baptist and Jesus' disciples are baptizing here in John 3 and 4, adults <coughs> baptized. Children circumcised. But after Pentecost, adults baptized. Children baptized. John is in an intermediate position. Before John, adults circumcised, children circumcised. After Pentecost, adults baptized, children baptized. John in the middle is in the intermediate state. With John, it's adults baptized, children circumcised. He comes halfway between the Old Testament and the New Testament in this regard too. So it is, there's a difference between John the Baptist's stage and after Pentecost regarding the promises specifically given to believers. With John the Baptist, we have no specific promises given to believers regarding their children. But after Pentecost, we emphatically do read of promises to believers with regard to their children. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter says, Acts 2, 38 and 39, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise, the promise of the Holy Spirit is bringing full messianic salvation, for the promise is unto you and to your children all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And then you have the promise repeated on the mission field in Philippi, where Paul says to the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. God will save your family. And so it is, with regard to family baptisms with water, there's no record of John the Baptist or Christ's disciples in John 3 and 4 baptizing families. But in the post-Pentecost New Testament church, yes, family and household baptisms are recorded. The household and family of Lydia, Acts 16. The family or household of the Philippian jailer, Acts 16. The family or household of Stephanus, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And now finally, I want to lead into this. This essential unity in the water baptism of John the Baptist, the water baptisms of the disciples of Jesus in John 3 and 4, and the water baptism in the Christian church, revealed to us yet another way in which John the Baptist is the forerunner who prepares the way for Christ and his kingdom the New Testament church. John the Baptist baptizes people, introducing the way for Jesus. And then when Jesus comes with his disciples, he baptizes people too. John 3 and 4. And then Jesus' disciples and the New Testament church baptize people, as has been happening now for 2,000 years. And John the Baptist was the first one who started this, given that specific role to introduce Christ New Testament church. And one final thing, this essential unity in the water baptisms of John the Baptist, <coughs> this is the 
disciples in John 3 and 4, and the New Testament church, means that we can especially apply John the Baptist's exhortations regarding baptism, in Matthew 3 and Luke 3, for instance, we can apply John the Baptist's exhortations regarding baptism to ourselves as regards what the older authors call improving our baptism. We received in water baptism a baptism of repentance. Are we repentant? Still sorry for our sins. You're to be sorry for your sins as an adult before you're baptized and you're emphatically to be sorry for your sins and to hate them and turn from them all your life long. It's a baptism into repentance as well as a baptism <coughs> of repentance. Are we repenting? That's the message of John the Baptist. That's the key word with him. Repent. <coughs> and therefore, John's second point would follow along. Are we doing works meet or befitting repentance? The way we live, does it indicate that we're turning from our sins more and more progressively, hating them, leaving them, and walking in righteousness? And then too, this repentance must show ourselves in a holy life in our calling. John the Baptist says that this baptism of repentance means for soldiers that you must live as a soldier as befits this baptism. And for tax collectors, this is how you must live. These are the sins and pitfalls you must avoid in your vocation. And the implication and application of this is, as those who have been baptized, are you living in your calling as a doctor or a nurse or as a teacher or a student or as a lawyer or a laborer in the office and at home as befits a baptism because the baptism with water, water is all about washing, testifies of the forgiveness of sins that I've been cleansed of them, that I'm righteous before God on the basis of what Jesus Christ achieved in his holy life and cross and that I'm continually being washed from my sins as I put away my evil deeds and live a sanctified life. And that all of this is in the Messiah and his cross. John the Baptist says he's just about to come. And in the Christian church, we know he has come. He's fulfilled his calling before God and made satisfaction for our iniquities. John's teaching on baptism brings this to us. And John's teaching on baptism brings this to us too. We have been baptized with water, whether it's children of believers or adults. If we do not, by God's grace, live this way, then we are a generation of vipers, but not the children of Abraham. Then we are not wheat to be gathered into the barn and harvested, but chaff, which is to be burned up with unquenchable fire. That's John. Then we are headed for the wrath to come. Amen.